Hey, I'm going to ask your pastor to stay up here if he would. If you're thankful today for your pastor, say amen. amen. And uh, this is a meaningful, meaningful day for a church. And uh, I often tell our church on times like this, on milestone moments, there's only one who deserves the glory. That's Jesus Christ. Um, he didn't say, hey, I'll build your church. He didn't say, I want you to build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's all about Jesus. It's all by his power. But he's gracious enough to allow people to have a part. So on a day like this, we have to glorify the Lord. On a day like this, secondly, there's a lot of thanks to be given. And I just want to say for those of you that are a part of this church family, thank you. Thank you for loving Jesus, for serving, for praying, for giving, for inviting, all the different things that are done. I think of the singers, the instrumentalists, the sound people, the dream team, all the different parts. Without people like you, churches like this don't happen. I saw some of our Coastline family here earlier, and, and uh, I feel the same about you. Were it not for people that were just faithful and who loved God and served others, it would never happen. But I think on a day like this, it's good for us to understand that were it not for the faith of one person who saw what we're seeing today before there was anything to be seen, none of the rest of us would be in this room right now. And so, Pastor Matt, I want to thank you and congratulate you for two years of ministry here. How many of you believe his, his vision for this church extends beyond two years? <laughs> so we're going to call today just a good start. But it was his faith that came to a place where nobody knew him. There was nothing awaiting his arrival, but a call that God had placed on his life. And so we honor you today for your faith in Jesus, your faithfulness to Jesus, and for your work ethic, and for you and your whole family. Katie, we've all been praying for you. It's so good to see you here today. I bring a gift to you. Daniel, can you bring that table over? Need something to set my Bible. I bring a gift to you from our church to let you know we love you, we're grateful for you. He, he made a statement, he said that he owes Coastline a debt of gratitude. He's humble, that's why he said that. Had we known what some of the great companies in the world are doing today, years ago, we would have been so glad to get the inside tip to invest in them. Well, I believe that our finances in this lifetime, they die with us, except for what we give to God. And one of the greatest favors God ever gave our church was the privilege of being able to invest in your pastor in Rock Hill Baptist Church. And so we love you guys so much. God bless you. All right. Well, I'd like to invite you today to take your copy of God's Word. We're going to be in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, what a great time of year to have a church anniversary because we're beginning a new year as individuals, as a church. We're preparing to enter into the third year of ministry here, and uh, this is a fantastic, fantastic time. Uh, just to kind of get us all on the same page as we get ready to go through this uh, message together from the Bible, if you would like to see God allow you to grow in your personal life and allow you to grow as a church family this year, say amen. All right, and now is where the study begins because I need to share with you that just hoping that will be the case or wishing that will be the case is totally inadequate. There's got to be more than that. How many of you like me have learned about this time in the year that making a resolution in and of itself won't do anything for you in the new year? I read an article in the USA Today in the first few days of the new year, and it said the average person will quit by January 12th all their new year resolutions. That meant by yesterday, the vast majority of Americans became quitters, okay? We knew that, that just deciding we hoped something or wished something would happen would not be enough. We've got to know that we have uh, really good goals in mind. Some have said these goals need to be specific and measurable and attainable and, and on. We've got to have good goals, and then we've got to have plans in place to allow us to accomplish those goals. Well, I'm here today to tell you that the Word of God tells us all we need to know to know God and to live a life that is pleasing to God. I'm telling you that to live the most powerful, productive, positive, impactful life you can imagine, all we need to do is to get in the Word of God and let the Word of God get, up, get in us and serve as, as our guide. You see, the Bible tells us of itself that it's a living book. 
The Bible says it's powerful, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing. The Bible says of soul and spirit, and, and it says of joints and marrow. In other words, it gets in deep. The Bible says of itself, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians told of the, of the Bible that all of it is given by inspiration of God and that all of it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, we find in the Bible what Paul called doctrine. Doctrine means taught truth. It's in the Bible that we can discern the truth of God, that which is right. We find in the Bible reproof, and that means when someone lets you know you're wrong. And God is kind enough to not just let us meander through life missing the point altogether. And so we find doctrine and we find reproof and then we find correction. That's not punishment. God in this sense is not punitive. He's a correcting God, like a loving father. So he tells us what's right. He tells us when we're wrong. And then he tells us how to get right. And then instruction in righteousness means he tells us how we can keep going in that which is right. So all we need to know for life can be found in, in the word of God. And we've got a passage before us today that I believe is a wonderful passage for getting a new year started, a new year of ministry. And we're going to read together here in Hebrews chapter 12. If you're able able to join me in standing this morning. I invite you to do that. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going to read, and uh, I'll start reading in verse 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Now, I'm going to read on, but we know that when the word of God was, was written, there were no chapter or verse designations. Now, I'm glad they're in there, or I couldn't have told you, turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. I would have just said, thumb around in Hebrews until you find this verse. So we're glad they're there. But Chapter 12 picks up on the heels of chapter 11. And if, you, if you've had the opportunity to read through the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 is a very famous chapter in the Bible, and it's a very important chapter in the Bible. We sometimes call it the Hall of Faith. It's a chapter that outlines the names of people that stood strong for God. They lived by faith. They trusted the Lord. And when we come into chapter 12, and the Bible speaks of this cloud of witnesses, I believe it's speaking of those faithful people of which we read in chapter 11. And then the Bible says that we're to uh, lay aside the sin, the weights that, that beset us. I believe in context there is a very specific sin of which the writer of Hebrews is speaking of here. This whole passage is dealing with faith, living by faith, trusting God. And when he turns the corner into chapter 12 and, and says there's a sin we need to set aside that's going to be a weight, it's going to be a barrier, it's going to hold us back and hold us down, I believe he's speaking there of the sin of unbelief, a lack of faith. And so he said we've got a great example, there's something we need to set down, the sin of unbelief. And then he says this, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. Again, I'll read on. I'm not a linguistic expert at all, but I do have a good Bible dictionary. That expression, looking unto Jesus, is actually two words in the language of the New Testament. It means to look to and away from. And I've had to learn in my Christian life, if I'm ever going to look at Jesus, I'm going to have to look away from those other things that would preoccupy or, or distract me. And, and so he says, listen, we need to set aside disbelief, unbelief, and we need to look away from those things distracting us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I want you to think of the expression near the end of verse 1, where the Bible says, let us run. I love that expression. I kind of feel there's a little aggression in that statement. Let's get after it. Let's go for it. Based on all that we've seen in Hebrews 11 and all that we know of Jesus, Let's just flat run for the glory of God. Our Father, I am so thankful to be in this room with these people at this time. 
And Lord, I pray that you would allow the preaching and teaching of your word this morning to challenge and encourage, perhaps comfort. But Lord, most of all, we pray that it would allow us to see you more clearly. I pray, God, that you would help all of us to make a decision that's most needed in our life. And may you be honored in it all, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and if that is the case, we have a lot of words in the passage we just read because there are a lot of metaphors or pictures that the writer here gives. And, and one of the analogies we find in this passage has to do with sports. And I love sports, and I love it when I read the New Testament and, and find that there are sports analogies that are given. The Apostle Paul must have been a great sports fan because he often talked about sports. And in fact, on one occasion in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In other words, he said the Christian life at times, it's like a boxing match. It's like a foot race. And when it came to running, he said, I have finished my course. I want you to know, folks and church family, we're in a race today. Now, what we have to know about our race is we're not racing one against another. My goal as I look at a new year of life is, is not to find someone else and say, I want to race them. I want to go faster than them or further than them. That's not how the race of the Christian life works. It's, it's a race that we're racing with the opportunities that God has given us and the gifts that God has given us. Now, everyone in this room, you have gifts and talents that God has deposited into your life. You, you have some areas of great strengths that God has given you in your life. And, and no two of us have the very same gifts or, or abilities or, or talents. But I want you to know you have gifts and abilities and talents. And also, all of us today have opportunities. No two of us have the same opportunities. But what the race of the Christian life is, it's racing with the gifts God has given us and the opportunities that God has given us. We're, in other words, living up to the potential that we have in Jesus Christ. The race of our life is, is to pursue the will of God. And it's the heart that says, Lord, I want to do all you'd have me to do. I want to be all you would have me to be. Lord, my life belongs to you. I want to live it for your glory. And it was with that that this passage said, let us run. Let's get after it. Now, I believe Paul's reference to sports primarily came from the Olympic games that they had in their day. They were called the Isthmian games. And I know a couple things about the runners in the Isthmian games that Paul would have known and that the readers of this letter would have known. First of all, if you were a runner in the Olympics in Paul's day, in the day of Hebrews, we know that you had to have been a free person. There were a lot of slaves then, and slaves weren't qualified to run. You had to be a free person. The second thing we know is you weren't running to honor yourself. You were honoring the country or the region where you came from. So if I were a runner, it wouldn't be, here's Steve Chapel in lane number one. No, it would be the representative of Oceanside in lane one. I would be running for the glory of the place from which I was coming. Now, if I won the race, that place may give me glory, but my intention was to glorify my people where I came from. And so to make the parallel today, I want you to know this before we get into the meat of this study. If you're a believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want you to know that when we speak of moving forward in life and growing in life and running in life and all of these things, the basis of it is an understanding that we are free in Jesus Christ. We're not running to earn his favor. We're not running to get kudos from God. We're not running to earn brownie points or to stave off an angry God. It's all based in an assurance that we are anchored and rooted in Jesus and his truth. We're not running to perform. We're running from hearts of love. Now you might be here today and say, but I'm not sure I'm a Christian or I'm still thinking about those things. I would say, great. I'm glad you're here. And we'll get back to that in a moment. But the basis for a good race in life is to say, you know, I know who I am in Jesus. I know whose I am. I belong to Jesus. The second part we've got to understand is we're not to run the race of our life for our own glory. For if you're a believer today, you've been bought, the Bible says, with the blood of Jesus Christ. We're to run for him. We're to race for him, if you would. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he went on to help us understand this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said, Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so the Bible calls us in a new year of ministry in a church, in a new year of life, to run for the glory of God, to run in his grace, understanding we are accepted in him. 
And with that backdrop in mind, the writer of Hebrews shares with us how to make the most of our race in life. Literally, I believe he provides the manual on how we can run this year and beyond. And, and I'll share several of these thoughts with you today. If you're taking notes, the first element we find in God's word here is this. We must have the right purpose. We must have the right purpose. Let's go back to verse 1 where our reading began. And there the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Bible's teaching that Jesus is to be the object or the focus of our life. He's the author and the finisher. And those words are so very important. The word author used here is a word that is translated in other places as captain or prince. And it's the idea of someone who has authority. We see that in the word author, someone who has authority, but it's someone who has leadership. And when it comes to life, the, the place we need to start is understanding that Jesus is the authority and that Jesus is the leader. And then the Bible says of Jesus that he is also the finisher. And that's a great word. And in fact, this word is used exactly one time in all of the Bible. And here's where it's used. A finisher. Say, what's a finisher? Someone who completes what they begin. Can I tell you today what Jesus is? He's a finisher. He's a finisher. When he was on the cross, he never one time said, I, I, I'm finished, that they finished me. No, he said, it is finished. The work is done. In fact, the Bible tells us, he who began a work in you, he'll be faithful to complete it. And so when we're running life, we've got to be looking to Jesus, who's the leader, the authority, and the completer in the course of our journey. Now, someone could say, Pastor, that sounds like a pastoral thing to say. This is church. It is Sunday, and you're telling us to look to Jesus. All right, I get it. Uh, very good but that's not highly practical for my life or for where I'm living. And I, I've, got, I've got to tell you, if that's your thought, you could not be more wrong. There's nothing of greater import for us as people than to understand the value of looking to Jesus in your life. You could say, perhaps, if you're a man like I am, but, but listen, Pastor, you've got to know I've got some problems in my marriage. I would say you're not going to fix them by staring at your marriage. Look to Jesus. And let me tell you what Jesus has to say, and I'll, I'll quote him if I may. He, he said, husbands, love your wives like I love the church. You see, as I look at my family, maybe I only see problems, but when I look at my family through Jesus, he'll help me. As a father, he'll say, don't provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nothing will make me a better father like looking at my children through Jesus. I, I begin to look to him. Jesus will tell me in the word principles that will help me in business. He'll tell me how to structure my time and, and number my days. He'll tell me how to serve, and I'm telling you today, the greatest thing you can do to live a life that counts, the greatest thing you can do to be a part of a church that's moving forward is to say, I want to live a life where I'm looking unto Jesus because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Some time ago, I had an opportunity to meet a, meet a man in our community, and, and uh, I was super impressed with him. He was probably in his early 60s, very distinguished, highly successful, and uh, I knew of some of his businesses. He had a beautiful home right on the water, a stable of awesome cars, and, and I was really glad to meet him. Uh, I got a call uh, a short time after that, real early one morning, and when I looked at my phone, I, a number came through. I did not know who it was. And when I answered it, it was this, this businessman I'd met, and uh, I could tell right away he was upset, and uh, he, he said to me, he said, I wanted to call and tell you I'm going to kill myself. And then he hung up. Now, I never one time took a class in Bible college on what do you do when you get that call. So I thought I should probably call back. Call back, no answer. Call back again, no answer. And just for a split second, and if you've been in those pressure moments, it seems like forever, but just really in a split second, I, I thought I, I need to get to his home as soon as possible. He didn't live that far from us. I, I jumped in my vehicle, uh, drove to his house, and when I pulled up, I saw a couple of police cars and uh, an ambulance and a fire truck, and, and I thought, oh, I'm too late. And uh, I thought, I should have called 911 is what I should have done. And uh, as, as I pulled up a little closer to park, I saw this man sitting out front, and the firefighters were talking with him. And thankfully, the Lord used that occasion in his life to bring him to himself. But, but I remember thinking, feeling rebuked in my own spirit for meeting someone and thinking, wow, look at all they have. What an admirable life. If I could be like him, that would be great. And listen, here's a man that set goals in his life. He had a purpose in his life. 
And he achieved every goal he had set. He accomplished every purpose that led him forward. He got the money. He got the house on the ocean. He got the cars. He, he, he had the prestige that went along with it. Listen, and here's what happened. When he reached the top of the ladder he was climbing, he realized it was leaned against the wrong building. He lived for all of those things. And when he got to the end, he said, none of it is fulfilling. None of it really matters at all. There was a vanity, a futility, an emptiness. And in my heart, as I observed him, I didn't say this in a judgmental way. I think you'll understand. But as a Christian, I looked at someone who testified to the emptiness of this world. And in my heart, I thought, he needs Jesus. He needs Jesus. The author, the leader, the finisher, the one that does the work. He needs Jesus. But did you know sometimes as Christians, we're a little less savvy when it comes to taking note of when our gaze fades from Jesus. That can't happen to people of faith, you know. Maybe you've heard of Peter, one of the more well-known apostles. He was on a boat one night in a raging storm, and here comes Jesus walking on the water, and Peter, in the midst of this storm, he looks at Jesus, and, and by faith, he steps out of the boat, and Peter literally begins to walk on the water. But the Bible gives us a very interesting footnote in Matthew chapter 14. The Bible says of Peter, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. In other words, he was looking no longer at Jesus, but now looking at the storm and the effects of the storm. And it was in that moment that he stopped looking at Jesus. He began to sink, and in the midst of sinking, he then looks back to Jesus and says, save me. And uh, note to self, it's good when we're sinking in life to make sure we're looking at Jesus. And I'm glad to tell you, he is gracious and, and merciful. But sometimes in our own lives, we can be going along, and, and we can drift in our closeness to the Lord. And so I'll ask you today, has there been a time in your Christian life when you were closer to Jesus than you are at this moment might be good for us today to say I need to affirm that my purpose is right that I'm looking unto Jesus back in the Old Testament there was a story it was a story of an occasion when the people of God had sinned and God did something very interesting to deal with their sin he sent poisonous snakes does anybody like snakes in here yeah there's a scientific word for people like snakes weirdos okay no, no not you but others okay i i'm terrified of snakes and i remember as a boy hearing this story oh man this story got me going god sent snakes and the snakes bit the people and the people started to die from the bites of these poisonous snakes well god had an even more interesting way to save these people in numbers 21 and verse 8 the bible says and the lord said unto moses make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. So the snake was made, the serpent put on a pole. And what did people have to do to that snake to be saved? Just look. That's what they did, and that's what happened. Just what God said is what took place. Now, years later in the New Testament, Jesus was having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus, and they're talking about heaven, and Nicodemus wants to have a relationship with God. And as Jesus talks with Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and, and, and certainly Nicodemus was familiar with this story as well. So Jesus says, it, it's like that, Nicodemus. When Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man and be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life I want you to notice the connection between the word look and the word believe and when I say that we're to look to Jesus what I'm saying today is we need to trust him completely we need to follow him wholeheartedly and all of life begins with with the relationship with Jesus and it's lived from there a life well lived is one that that knows Jesus as Savior, travels through life knowing that Jesus is leading the way and that he finishes what he starts. It's in Jesus we find out who we are. We know what we're to pursue. We know why it is important, and we know in him it can all be accomplished. We have to make sure we have the right purpose. Here's a second thought today. We have to have the right pattern. We have to have an example as the writer of Hebrews continued, he wrote this of Jesus. He said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I want you to take note. Jesus Christ, God the Son, God in flesh, endured the cross, despising the shame 
and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He, he was saying, uh, listen, as you look to Jesus, you'll not only find the purpose you need in life to keep running, but you will find the pattern that will help you as you go. In fact, one verse later in verse 3, let's look there. The Bible says it this way, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now again, get the picture of the setting of this passage on the heels of Hebrews 11, those who live by faith. In that great cloud of witnesses, we find an example and an encouragement. But can I tell you today, when, when you hit the rough patch in life, uh, when you're feeling maybe I should slow down or pull over on the side of the highway of life, there's no greater pattern for you to follow, no greater example for you in life than Jesus Christ who endured the cross. He kept going. He pressed on. Now, I want us to wonder together, what is it that enabled Jesus to endure the cross? Now, remember, Jesus, he laid aside the prerogatives of his deity willingly. He, he never used his, his, God, his God qualities in that sense, those special times. He, he, he didn't do that. He did for others. He healed others. He, he did miracles. But, but Jesus here, he, he did not use his divine powers for his own personal needs in fact, the, the, uh, Satan, the devil, even tempted him to do that. We know in Matthew chapter 4, but Jesus refused. He wasn't going to do that. I want you to know it was our Lord's faith that enabled him to endure. It was the joy that was set before him. Jesus shows us a pattern of how to keep going. Uh, I try to get to the gym about four times a week. And uh, I don't go to the gym to get my social needs met. A lot of people do. Have any of you noticed this? And, uh, but if you go enough, you see people, and you've got to say hi and shake hands and knuckle bumps and all those things people do, you know. But there's a group of guys, uh, uh, probably late teens, maybe early 20s, that I see quite often at the gym. And, and when I see them there, they're always huddled around a bench, and they're putting as much weight on as they can to see how much they can lift. They want to be strong, and they'll get their few reps in, and then they'll stand in front of the mirror. Have you ever seen these people at the gym, you know? Uh, and, you know, I do it now. I don't want to tear out the seam in my coat here, but you know what I'm talking about, and, and uh, they want to be strong, and, and I understand. I'm not young anymore, but you know, for them, it's all about looking good, and I, I guess I understand that, but th they just want to be strong. That, that's their goal, but when it comes to endurance, if you were to say, can you drop into 100 push-ups, it, it'd be a different story, not, not much endurance. If you were to say, can you run a mile, they, they couldn't do it. Maybe there's a measure of strength, but there's no endurance. I want you to know, as, as you read the Bible, you're not going to find commandments from God that says, get strong. He's, he's going to say, be strong. In other words, the divine enablement, what we need to do life, what we need to live life is from God. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves. Our sufficiency is in him. And so the strength we need in life comes from God, but... Strength is accessed by endurance. The word endurance, by definition, means to come up under. I want you to know it's the exact opposite of quitting. You say, well, how do I get through a tough time? Well, don't quit. Keep going. Persevere. You say, well, how am I going to make it? The strength you need is on its way. God is the source of our strength. He's calling us to endure. And that's what God's message is for us today. Jesus tells us we're to look to him. He's the one worthy of our consideration. And, and friends, I want you to know he is the one that shows us the way. And then we find in this passage the third element I'll share with you today. We must have the right perspective. There's something incredible about Jesus that we need to understand. He had an awareness that the pain through which he was going would lead to a greater gain. He had the ability to look through that moment and to see the bigger picture. He knew he would rejoice in fulfilling the Father's will. He knew that he was providing for our salvation. He, he knew that as horrific as the cross was, that he would not remain in the grave. He, he knew that, that that moment was leading him somewhere. There are some psalms that we refer to as messianic psalms because they're psalms that were written in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. There was a psalm written by David in Psalm 16, and, and in these words, which Jesus certainly would have known, the Bible says, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart's glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, 
Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus had an understanding. I'm going to go uh, to this hill and I'm going to be crucified on an old rugged cross. They're going to take my body down and they're going to lay it in a borrowed tomb. He borrowed it. He only needed it a few days. They were going to roll a, a big stone in front of that tomb. But Jesus understood that his body would not see corruption, that that wasn't the end of the story, that that's not where he would lie forever, physically speaking. He knew that on the third day, he would victoriously, literally, bodily rise again from the dead. He knew he was providing so that you could be saved spiritually and I could be saved spiritually. He knew he was fulfilling the Father's will and he looked beyond the pain to know there was a gain coming. Jesus endured. He knew that the conflict would lead to a conquest. It was that perspective that he had it was November 24th, 1989. I was a junior in high school. It was the day after Thanksgiving. We just had a great Thanksgiving with our family, and it was the Friday after, and my mom and dad went away uh, on a trip, and they left me at home alone. Uh, how many of you have, have kids? Never do that. <laughs> Bad. Say, my kids are good. No kids are good, which is why God gave them to parents, okay? So my mom and dad left, and I don't know what you would have done, but I thought, sounds like an adventure's in order, all right? Wonder what we can do. That day was a beautiful day. It was just so still, I couldn't believe it. I mean, there just wasn't any wind at all, and it was super warm. One of those freakishly warm fall days we get here, you know? And uh, so I called my friends, Kevin and Artie, and, and if they were here today, I would say what I'm about to say. Both of them uh, are dumb. Both of those guys are dumb, all right? To make things worse, I'm dumber than either of them, all right? So we got dumb, dumber, and the dumbest of all, and we're wanting to get into an adventure. And my big idea that day was, hey, it's really warm outside. Why don't we go take my dad's sailboat Boat, and we'll sail it over to Catalina. We'll spend the night, have a great time together. And, and that was kind of the big idea. And uh, they thought that was great because they're dumb. And uh, uh, the, the topic did come up. Steve, do you know how to sail? I'd never sailed by myself, you know. But uh, my thought was, I watched my dad do it once. If he can do it, surely I can do it, you know. We went down there and, and uh, sure enough, we started motoring uh, out of the harbor. And about that time, the wind had picked up quite a bit, actually. And um, we got to the end there of San Pedro. There's a big, long harbor. You pass all the cruise ships, and we finally got out beyond the breakwater. Man, the wind is ripping at that point, just absolutely ripping. And uh, at first, it was kind of exciting. You know, it was like 50% terrifying and 50% exhilarating, and we got out a little bit further. And uh, then we kind of hit that point where it's like we're almost too far to turn back. The wind kicked up even more. I later learned it was the windiest day of that year. And the waves are raging. The wind is ripping. And uh, we're kind of now on borderline thinking that this could be the end of us, you know. And uh, we're, we're sailing, getting beat up. It's slow going. And uh, finally, it starts to get dark and the cloud rolls in. It was one of these Santa Ana wind situations and that hot air is hitting that cold sea water. And it's getting dark with the fog. And, and uh, uh, I can't see Catalina anymore. Now, there were all kinds of instruments on that boat to tell you how to sail in a situation where you couldn't see. But I didn't know how to use any of them. And I, I could use a compass. That was easy enough. And I kind of lined it up. But, but you could be thinking, I'm sailing east, but if the currents are moving you south, I had this fear, man, we're going to pass that island up. And, and about the time I was just sure we were going to be lost at sea, I saw a little light on Catalina. We made our way not into Avalon. We made it into Isthmus Cove. And I remember we pulled in and the harbor master came out and he cussed me up one side and down the other. There's a small craft advisory. What kind of an idiot would bring a boat out on a day like this? And I said, this kind. Okay, I did it. And he tied us up, not in one place, he tied us up in two places. And he told us in no uncertain terms, he said, if this boat comes loose tonight, you're on your own. You're on your own. And uh, it wasn't quite as fun after he said that for some reason. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat when it was in heavy weather, but it rocks like this, which means the middle is the part that actually moves the most. And so dumb, dumber, and dumbest of all, we were all huddled right in the middle of the boat. And uh, we were eating our cup of noodles that we brought for a good, healthy dinner. And uh, most of that night, there's, there's few worse feelings in life worse than being totally seasick on a boat you know you cannot get off of. All night long, we rocked and rocked and rocked. The next morning, we thought, let's get out of here. 
sun's up. The wind was still just raging. And uh, so we uh, untied and we turned that little diesel motor on. And keep in mind, on a Santa Ana, it's offshore wind. And so we're aiming towards the shore, which means the wind is hitting us. With that motor on full throttle, our boat would not move. We couldn't get away. We thought, what are we going to do? Well, uh, th there, there wasn't much intelligence among us, but we decided, what if we try and go sideways a little bit? Maybe that'll help. And so we'd kind of zigzag, zigzag till we broke free of the island. And when that happened, it changed things. We put the sail up. Long story short, if you're wondering, we lived. Can I get an amen? amen. We put, oh yeah, I'll clap for that. Thank you. You're glad I'm alive. Nice people. We put the sails up. We had the best sail I've ever had in my life from there coming back, uh, less than three and a half hours from Isthmus Cove uh, back into the dock, and, and it was an unbelievable sa uh, sail. 30 years later, I now have a story I can tell you, and you're wondering why did I tell you that story, and I did so because I believe that story will be very much like your next year of ministry and your next year of life. You're going to hit some storms, and you're going to think, is this, is this the end? Is this where my story stops? You're going to have times when the fog blows in and you're, you're, you're not going to uh, know where you're going. You're going to lose your bearings. You're not going to have a vision for what is the next step that God is to have me to take in life. You're, you're going to have some lonely nights where you're just kind of rocking and rolling with all that life is bringing you. And you're going to have some exhilarating times when you're going to do things beyond your ability. God's going to take you places. You're going to say, man, I don't even deserve to be here. This is the ride of, of my life. And you're going to have a story to tell. You're going to have a testimony to share. And what's going to make the difference? It's not just the power of God because His power is constant. It's our ability to endure, to say, God, I'm going to trust you. It all begins with you. It all culminates in you. And I will follow your will for my life. Friends, listen, if I could boil the game plan for 2019 down to one word, it would be the word Jesus. Jesus. We're to run in life with Him. We're to run in life to him. We're to run in life for him. And I want to challenge this church and each of you here today to make a decision in Jesus. I want to find my purpose. I want to do what I do in life because of what it is he has to say. I want to find my pattern in him. I want to consider Jesus. How is it that he endured the cross? And I want to gain a perspective that understands I can't get a testimony without a test. Why would I complain about the very thing God put in my life to help me understand how good he is? I want to share that with others. And as we have that heart, God will lead us forward. Our Father, today we're so grateful that you are the God we've sung about today, the God we've read about today, the God I've been able to teach about today. Lord, we're thankful that you are a God that has a plan that is so immense that there's a place for each of us within your plan and God, I would ask you today to open our hearts to the point that we would understand that you are the author, the only one with the authority, that you are the leader, the divine enabler, the one that shows us the way, and that you are the finisher, the one that can bring to completion that which needs to happen in our lives. God, I pray this would not just be some intellectual understanding that we could pair it to someone if they were to ask, but may this be something that we are living personally in our lives. God, be glorified in this place and these people and in each of us as individuals. With our heads bowed this morning, I just want to ask this question. I wonder how many of you today would say, you know, Pastor Steve, as you did your best to teach us the Bible today. You said something. You read a verse. You made a statement. There was something in the time in the Word today that I think was good for me to hear. It might be useful in my life. There, there was something for me in that study this morning. Are there those like that by the testimony? Just a quickly raised hand. There was something for me in that study today. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You may put your hands down. Now, here's what I want to ask those of you that raise your hands to do. I want you to nail down in your life, what is it that prompted that hand to go up? And then whatever it is that God spoke to you about today, I want you to speak to God about that same thing. D don't let this time come to an end without you saying, Lord, we got in the Bible today. We sought to learn and I want to grow. And there was an area today in that study that kind of touched my heart so much so it prompted my hand to go up when the pastor asked that question. Talk to God about those very things. Now, in the midst of my message, I said that when we know that we have a relationship with Jesus, that's the beginning of it all. And when I said that, I said, maybe you're here today and in your heart you're thinking, you know, I'm not 
percent sure I have that relationship. Well, friends, listen, the best news in the world is you can know that. I would never be so bold as to ask you to take my word on that. But I'm glad to tell you we can take God's word on that. The Bible tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. We don't have to just hope so. And this is a private time. It's a time of prayer. Heads are bowed. But I wonder, are there those here this morning you'd say, you know, Pastor, when you said that, there was something in my mind. This is something I'm thinking about. I'm really not sure where I stand with God. I'm not certain if I were to die today that I'd spend forever in heaven with Him. And, and I don't mind the thought at all of you, Pastor, thinking of me as you have a prayer. I wonder, are there those like that this morning? You'd say, Pastor, I need that relationship with Jesus. I need that relationship with Jesus. Maybe there are other decisions in need of being made today. Perhaps you feel led of God to do what others will do today and follow the Lord and believers' baptism or to unite with this church by way of membership. What a great decision that would be. But I pray that each of us would continue to move forward for the glory of Jesus this year.